Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Defund the police. That phrase has become part of the rallying cry of protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement. While some throughout the nation are calling for a complete overhaul of their municipal departments, some here in San Antonio are hoping that some police department funds are reallocated to help improve community relations. Our Devin Clark with the call for change and how the San Antonio Police Union president is responding to all this. We want to get rid of that barrier between law enforcement and that fear from the community. You know, Local community activist Antonio Lee says helping to bridge the gap includes redistributing some of the San Antonio Police Department's funding, putting monies towards community engagement efforts. We got to work all together. While current San Antonio Police Officers Association President Mike Helley pointed out several efforts already in the works, like cultural sensitivity trainings for officers and recreational activities like midnight basketball, he agreed that the police killing of George Floyd in Minnesota shows there is still a need to improve the local relationship between the public and law enforcement. Because if it was up to par when these type of incidents happen, I, I would hope that the community would have stepped up and say, hey, y'all need to kind of relax because this is not this is not what's happening here. Though Helly says reallocating department funds puts a strain on resources already stretched thin. What, where do you want it to come from or where do you want to cut? You, you want less policemen or do you want less patrol cars or where would you start cutting it? Helly says either way, the decision on what to do with budget funds is made by the mayor and city council. Every single year they go through a, uh, um, actually a public process that allows community input on where they want money to be divided. And on Friday, we spoke to Mayor Ron Nirenberg about how he plans to approach the issue of possible police reform. That story can be found on our website, ksat.com. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Peaceful protests in honor of George Floyd happening right now as protesters make their way through downtown. They started off at the Blue Star Arts Complex where several speakers spoke about the issues at hand. Jaffney Gray is at the second stop of the protest. And Jaffney, how is how are things going there right now? Yes, guys, we literally just saw hundreds of people marching, making their way from the Blue Star Arts Complex. Now, the entire event started at four, but I don't know if you can see. Well, actually, yeah, you can see off in the distance just how many people made their way. It started about 20 minutes, the actual march itself, made their way right here to La Villita, where I'm at now. Many speakers, like organizers, and even former presidential candidates, Julian Castro, spoke about the changes needing to happen in our nation. Now, people who participated say there's a good reason why they are protesting for the 10th straight day in a row and will continue as long as they can. But the history that we do have, we started off steps behind. So every time we have a protest, it's just another progressive step in the right direction, away from our past, but into what should be right now, but into our future. The next stop will be at the Torch of Friendship, where they will hear from more speakers. Now, around 7.30, they plan to end at Hemisphere Park as a final reminder of the change that they want to see happen. Now, tonight at 10, I'll have a wrap-up of today's event, and you'll see exactly all the change that everybody wants to have and wants to be made in honor of George Floyd. For now, I'm Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. In Houston, friends and family preparing to say goodbye to George Floyd tomorrow. Today, thousands of people lined up outside the Fountain of Praise Worship Center to pay their respects at a public memorial. Bill Barajas from our Houston sister station KPRC spoke with members of Floyd's family. Well, the doors here opened just before noon, and since then, we have seen a steady flow of people, people of all colors and backgrounds. You can see some of that crowd just behind me waiting to get inside. Everyone we have spoken to talked to us about change and the importance of being here to see that change through all while paying their respects to George Floyd. The crowd was busted, the line taking twists and turns as thousands braved the Houston heat to say their goodbyes. It's very ast astounding. You see all walks of life uh, globally, internationally, and then something to be said is that it's a diverse crowd. Those in attendance were asked to wear masks and gloves. Only 15 people were allowed in at a time and were given 10 minutes to view the body. Teresa Taylor brought her daughter. She said she wanted her to be a part of history. He looks very, he looks rest, he's resting. He looks very beautiful. Um, he looks very handsome. Yeah, he's resting in peace. Mary Ginn went to high school with George here in Houston. She says Big Floyd dreamed of changing the world. Now, 
you did it in a bigger way. You did it in God's way. So now you're changing everything and everybody. And we're just grateful to be a part of it. That change coming in the form of protests across the country calls for justice and reform. Floyd's family also delivering remarks today. They were joined by family members of other black men killed during encounters with police, including the mother of Eric Garner. It just hurts a lot just, just being here, just talking. It's, it's pain. I, I just I thank y'all so much for coming out to support us. Don't go home and don't do anything. You're paying your respects, but the most respect you can pay is to help this family. And today's viewing is set to end at 6 o'clock, but again, still lots of people here trying to get inside because tomorrow's funeral service is for family and friends only. In Houston, Bill Barajas, KSET 12 News. Happening tomorrow, another way to honor the life of George Floyd through service. The San Antonio Food Bank has designated tomorrow as a day of service in the name of Floyd. Volunteers are welcome to assist the food bank in distributing food to those in need in our community. There will be a mobile pop-up distribution center set up at Traders Village. Volunteers are needed both there and at the food bank's warehouse. The food bank stands against racism, we stand against injustice, and we want San Antonio to come together in what I think is the purest form of love, and that's service. Those wishing to receive food tomorrow can pre-register on the food bank's website. We have a link to get there posted on ksat.com. We got word late this afternoon the city will be lighting several buildings in crimson and gold to honor George Floyd beginning tonight at 8:15. Slowly and with safety the top priority, the Bear County Courthouse Complex is moving toward reopening. Major steps in that direction are being taken this week. Paul Venema with what those steps are and where they will lead. While continuing to urge that whenever possible court proceedings be conducted remotely, the local administrative judge has issued an order reopening all courts effective next Monday. As much as possible, judges are encouraged to ensure that that folks do not come to the courthouse. Things will look much different when in-person proceedings in non-essential cases begin. Judges, the court reporter, and courtroom clerk all will be behind plexiglass shields, and seating will be restricted. When we return to in-person hearings, um, we know for sure it's going to have to look very different because now we have to incorporate social distancing. Figure out six feet. Meza staff is already planning and measuring her courtroom to prepare right. for next week. All right, and what's the next one? Another change, Runhell's order calls for all courts to initially operate on an alternated basis. Each court is going to only operate on certain days, so it's important that on a particular floor, very few people or as few people as possible are going to be in the courthouse. The space in holdover cells for inmates in each courtroom will also be limited. There's only going to be five inmates brought over for one court each day. For the public, the rules remain the same. All the screening is going to take place before anybody can enter any of the courthouse complexes. The reopening order includes all courts from state district courts down to justice of the peace courts. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic. Let's take a live look with the TransGuide camera at I-35 at Sam Marcos and you can see traffic pretty light out there. I hope if you were out and about today, your car has AC and it was working. You needed it Something today. You yeah. definitely did. And there's no doubt about it. The summer heat is on and that can mean sticker shock when you get your next utility bill. It's not only hot. Many of us are staying home more using more AC, cooking more, using more electronics. To try to keep your bills from skyrocketing. Start with the number one energy sucker in the home, the air conditioner. Adjusting your thermostat settings is actually one of the simplest and most significant things you can do to keep your energy bills under control. Every degree helps, but CPS Energy recommends you set your thermostat at 78 degrees. Programmable and smart thermostats can help by adjusting your settings for you. you can also pay to keep your AC filters clean, make sure doors and windows are weather stripped. Use those ceiling fans, unplug chargers when you're not using them, and avoid using appliances like clothes dryers between 3 and 7, the hottest part of the day. 
some good tips to remember. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam, a very steamy 97 degrees out there, Adam. Yeah, very sticky, hazy, hot, humid. That's what we're dealing with outside right now. And our high temperature today, 97 degrees, and that's the current rating at the airport. But when you factor in the humidity, it feels like it's just over 100. Dew point at 68, so not only hot, but of course, humid as well. Temperatures gradually falling this evening, but the humidity, it's staying the same and it's going to be muggy. By midnight, we'll be about 84 degrees. And as we get into early tomorrow morning, we'll eventually settle down in the upper 70s. As for the aquifer, it took a bit of a hit today, down 7 tenths of a foot, and just mold reported its low at 2.30. Some changes to talk about for the rest of this week. We'll touch on that coming up. Well, this has been a trying time for our nation and our state as we continue to navigate through the coronavirus crisis and hold conversations about racial inequality. Here to speak with us about some of those issues is Governor Greg Abbott. Thank you so much for joining us, Governor. Sure, my pleasure, thank you. And Governor, I, I want to begin by um, stating that you were in Houston today attending services for George Floyd. I understand you had the opportunity to meet with George Floyd's family. Number one, what was that encounter like? And I understand you also raised the possibility of future legislation by way of the George Floyd Act. Can you offer us some specifics on that? Sure, so I had a, a lengthy private meeting with the uh, George Floyd's family uh, in their home. Uh, and I got to uh, visit with all of them and uh, really get to know them. And I can see they truly are people of God. Uh, they're hurting, uh, but also they're hopeful uh, for the legacy of what George Floyd can stand for. And they, they know that uh, this is a pivotal time uh, in the United States where uh, there is an opportunity to bridge racial divide, uh, but also uh, to address things like the type of police brutality uh, that led to George Floyd's death. Uh, and so uh, while we were all mourning uh, the, the loss of a human life, uh, we were also uh, looking forward to uh, making sure that uh, he will not have died in vain, uh, that his life will be uh, the stimulant for uh, reforms that will make Texas and the country a better place. Give me some more specifics on those reforms. What do you think needs to happen from here? Well, already there are reforms that are being discussed in, in police departments and in city halls. Uh, and then the state of Texas will uh, take up reforms also. Uh, the, the simplest reform would be to, to make sure uh, police don't use the type of strategy that uh, this officer who killed George Floyd was using. Uh, there's no reason uh, in an arrest like this uh, for the officer to have his knee on the neck uh, of this person they are arresting. Uh, there, there, there must be uh, better strategies that can be used. So that, that is a step, but uh, there, as, you, as you might imagine, there, there is so much more uh, that members of the legislature are offering up, uh, and we are beginning these discussions right now. Uh, for, for legislation, uh, discussions have to begin now. Bills need to be uh, filed here when the filing period opens up in the fall, uh, and that will lead to further conversations that will lead uh, to legislation that will pass, just like what we passed in the, the Sandra Bland Act, or the, the Timothy the Coal Act and so many others that made Texas a better state. I can't help but notice your tie and the colors of it. Uh, we talked about how some San Antonio buildings tonight are going to be lit up in uh, in crimson and gold. Talk about your ties. There's significance to that. There is. George Floyd was a great athlete uh, in high school at Houston Yates High School, uh, and I'm wearing the colors of his high school. He played both uh, football and basketball. He actually went on and played uh, basketball in college, but uh, everyone in Houston is uh, dressing out uh, in these colors because uh, it is representative uh, of the colors of the team for which he played at Houston Yates. Switching gears, Governor, talk a little bit about the coronavirus. We have seen a phase reopening of the state over the course of the past several weeks. Do you have a specific timeline for a full reopening? When can Texans expect that? Listen, we, we want it as soon as possible. That, that We need to get past this point in time where we are right now, where we are still evaluating uh, whether or not there was any increase because of Memorial Day and now uh, whether or not there could be any increase in the aftermath of these uh, very large protests that have taken place. You know, we've had thousands of people gather so close together for such a long period of time uh, in ways that didn't follow the distancing practices, uh, and we do not know yet whether or not that will cause an increase or a spike uh, in the number of people testing positive for COVID-19. If 
we can get past this time period for the next 14 days, it will mean even more opening up for business in the state of Texas. I know we have you for such a short time. I want to jump around on a lot of subjects here. Uh, you called for uh, the Bear County Republican chairman to step down, Cynthia Brim. She says she won't do that. Are you, I, I mean, how can you make that happen? Or would you still like her to step down uh, in the light of the controversial comments she made about George Floyd? Well, for one, there is no official authority uh, for them to step down. But if I recall correctly, I think there may be a runoff race yes. uh, in the race for that county chair position right now. Uh, and so everyone who has the opportunity to vote in that will understand this controversy uh, and how it reflects poorly upon uh, the local GOP there. Uh, and hopefully they will make the right decision. Governor Greg Abbott joining us live. We appreciate your time, Governor. We'll be right back. Actually, Actually let's go to weather. Hi, 97 okay. degrees All right. out there. We got, we got to talk. We did, that's maybe the one subject we didn't talk to the governor about, just how hot it is <laughs> out there. Uh, yeah. 97 degrees, not 100 but, but I don't, pretty close. It feels like it. It does Might actually. Well be. Yeah, felt like it was a little over 100 when you factored in the humidity. Yeah. And tomorrow, I think we're going to crank it up just a little bit more. So take a look at our almanac today. 97, the high temperature after a low of 75, both above average for this time of year. But the record high, 101, set back in 1948. Tomorrow, the record is 104. And I think we'll be shy of that again tomorrow. Looking at the high temperatures across the state, Del Rio really stands out, I should say, across South Texas. Del Rio really stands out at 107 for the high. That's a record for the day today. The old record was 104, and that's their current reading at 104. 100 Pleasanton, 100 Uvalde, Carrizal Springs, 104. The rest of us well into the 90s. A little bit lower in Corpus Christi at 88 because they have that higher humidity. Now, tomorrow's going to be the hottest day of the week, probably be right near 100. And then we get into Wednesday through the weekend. And for the most part, we'll be in the mid 90s. We do have a little cool front that's going to pay us a visit by tomorrow afternoon, and that'll pave the way for some changes for the rest of the week. Now, tomorrow, it's not just about the heat, but also the humidity. So it's going to be hot. We looked at that high temperature around 100. But when you factor in the humidity for the afternoon hours, it could feel like it's anywhere from 105 to 112, especially east of I-35. And that's where we have the heat advisory that's in effect from noon to 7 p.m. tomorrow. This does include San Antonio, though I think our potential is probably a heat index of 105 to 109. Still very hot and heat advisory criteria. It's that humidity, not only hot, but it's muggy out there. Dew points. 70s and even some upper 60s, but watch how things change. I mentioned that cool front that's going to pay us a visit tomorrow afternoon. Still very muggy in the morning. Dew points well into the 70s, very sticky into the afternoon. Still very humid, but notice that drier air starting to work its way into the hill country and even Valverde, Maverick counties. And that takes us into Wednesday and the humidity is swept away. And this is going to be an unusual stretch of low humidity and lack of humidity in the air. As for rain chances, tomorrow's a 20% chance, and that's it, that's all we have. It's this cool front, or not as hot front, not as humid front, that'll be moving in, and that could kickstart just a few little isolated showers and storms tomorrow afternoon. For the most part, a sunny day tomorrow, you get into the afternoon, bright sunshine, then a little line of clouds should form into the afternoon. With it, could be a few pop-up showers or thunderstorms, and if a storm does develop, the outside chance does exist that it could become strong or severe, but again, only 20% chance of that storm developing. 78 in the morning, near 100 in the afternoon, but feeling like it's anywhere from 105 to 109. And then the lack of humidity is going to be nice. Wednesday through the weekend, that's going to mean more pleasant mornings below average with temperatures in the 60s. So that'll be enjoyable. But I am bracing myself for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks so much, Adam. Now, if I remember right, last time we checked in on the Spurs injuries, Jakob Pertl is already out. Now you add LaMarcus Aldridge. Well, and what's interesting about this with LaMarcus, we thought the hiatus would actually do him well and be able to get back on the floor. But at some point between the time that the season was called off for the time being and the restart, they decided to go ahead and have surgery on his right shoulder. When we come back, we'll let you know what that means in the future for the Spurs here. And when it comes to high school student athletes under the UIL umbrella, they're back.
When the Spurs in the NBA resumes the 2019-2020 season next month at Disney World, the Spurs will be without LaMarcus Aldridge. The seven-time All-Star had to have arthroscopic surgery on his right shoulder and has lost for the rest of the season. The surgery was actually performed in Dallas on April the 24th, but the Spurs withheld the news until today. Now the league and its Players Association have agreed to restart the season of the Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World. Aldridge originally suffered the injury against Utah on February 21st. Will continue to play against Oklahoma City on the 23rd of that same month before taking six games off, returning again to score 24 points against Dallas on March the 10th before the season was halted the next day. Appearing on Zoom with reporters this afternoon, Spurs general manager Brian Wright discussed moving forward. All of our guys are excited um, to get back and, and get back in the gym uh, and get going. Obviously, being shut down the last three months um, has been tough in a lot of ways. Um, so we're excited to compete. We're excited to, to go. Obviously, it's a heavy lift. Um, and, you know, really want to commend the league office and the Players Association, Commissioner Silver, and the leaders at the PA um, in bringing it all together. Um, it's a lot that has to get done between now and then. But, you know, we look forward to, to getting out there and continuing to compete and, and finishing the season strong. The Spurs' chances of making the playoffs are already a long shot when the season resumes next month in Orlando. Now it just got a lot worse without LaMarcus. Today is today. All University Interscholastics League high school student athletes can return to campus to begin summer workouts since it was all shut down last March due to the coronavirus. Out at Somerset High School today, we can see the Bulldog staff taking their temperatures of their players before their voluntary workouts. It includes no more than two hours, Monday through Friday. An additional 90 minutes are sports specific. One staff member per 10 players. If they are working out, they must maintain a distance of 10 feet. If not, six feet will do. From the parents, I mean, we, I've had a whole bunch of phone calls this week just say, hey, coach, are we ended up having this? Are we going to do it? And uh, we're all fired up. Yeah, we're, we're at it going. Uh, going. Uh, I know that our athletic directors, we've st to, uh, spoke about it around the state, and the, the safety of the kids is the main thing. Uh, we do, yes, we want to get back to athletics, but the safety of our kids are the main thing. we got about 100 kids that are lined up, ready to end up going. They've been sitting at home, and they're, they're ready to get out and work. All right, likewise, here in San Antonio, the Lanier Vokes were on the field today for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic shut down high school sports in March. There must be separate entry and exit passages for players. No use of the locker rooms or showers. Players must come dressed from home and equipment must be wiped down at the end of the session and after each use. But the Vokes were focused more on general exercise for the first day of practice. We're trying to get them back in shape a little bit and uh, we're not using the weight room yet because we don't want to use spotters yet. And for, for most lifts, you need a spotters. But we, we, we have some, bar, uh, some bars out here. They weigh 45 pounds. And for some of them, this is the first time they've touched a weight since 1st of March. So we're just getting, trying to get them reacquainted. There you go. The Texas private and parochial schools were allowed to begin workouts last Monday. Today, the UIL gave the green light under the umbrella in the state of Texas. That is great to see. We're going to visit more schools for you tomorrow as well and checking in on schools such as Alamo Heights, who has a new head coach this year. All right. Thank you, Greg. Before we had to break, we want to check in with Live 12. It is showing us the scene over the Arneson River Theater, that live shot that you saw earlier with Jaffney Gray. Those protesters had walked from the Blue Star Complex. They are now down by uh, the Arneson River Theater. Yeah, the idea was for them to go to the Torch of Friendship statue and then come back. I believe that's what we're seeing right now as those peaceful protesters gather inside the Arneson River Theater. It gives you a good idea of just how many of them there are. We'll be right back. Welcome to our KSAT Q&A. This is the time where we talk to local experts or people that are out in the field to tell us their experiences and what they think about what they see going on. And I, I want to welcome James Lewis with us tonight from J12 Designs. Right off the top, James, tell us what J12 does. Yeah, J12 Designs, uh, we are a full service agency. We do everything from logo design to business cards. Uh, interior graphics for your office but we specialize in website design and uh, app development and uh, really specializing in the more complex website projects tell me what's it, what your thoughts on what you're seeing uh, since the death of George Floyd uh, from a social 
standpoint. You, you have so many facets of this thing, and I, that's why I wanted to bring you on to listen to your stories. You're a, you're a small business owner. You're downtown. Uh, talk about your thoughts just on a personal level of what happened to George Floyd. Yeah, you know, before I comment, I want to recognize all the Black Lives Matter uh, leaders and organizers who are on the ground and um, really at the table fighting for change. And and when I saw that video, uh, obviously I was heartbroken like everybody else. It was just hard to watch. And what I'm seeing now is a response to that um, that's kind of, I would say, uh, crowded with a lot of different facets. So you got the, the protests and the rioting and, and, and the, all sorts of properties being damaged, but I really don't want the, the riots and all the negativity to get us off track. I don't want that to distract us from the larger issue, which is really just accountability. Mr. Lewis, as a business owner, are you talking to your staff and employees about some of these issues and fostering discussions about race? And if so, what are those discussions like? Yeah, so uh, everybody here at J12, um, we just so happen to all be uh, minority. We are, uh, uh, we don't have a large staff. Uh, it's a lean operation, but uh, the designers who I have here, we are all talking and really just venting about what we what's been inside of us and we really haven't had a chance to really talk about it so again this the good thing that has happened on all of this is more people are talking very uh exchanging experiences we're telling our stories not just amongst each other or as minorities but just to everybody so now people uh who are not of color can hear our story and say, wow, I had no idea it was like that for you. And that's one of the that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because I think that there's so much value in us listening instead of talking. So what is James Lewis's experience? Yeah, you know, for me uh, as a black business owner and from what I do, um, there are times when you may call uh, to have a website done and you're probably not expecting a young black man to walk through the door, right? So for me, it's a little bit hard to treat every client, uh, every new client uh, the same. And when I say that, when I might go into a meeting, um, I may have to break down some obstacles uh, first for people to take me serious. You know, I've had clients say, wow, I had no idea you were black. Um, and I can see when I walk into a room, uh, people are like, wow, OK, well, let's listen to what he has to say. So for me, there's a lot of experiences where I have to really start to break down some barriers before people take me serious. And then after I talk and they understand that I know what I'm talking about, it's all easy. So it's a lot of those experiences. And, you know, most of the time after I get through talking to someone, they know who I am. After that, it's, it's no problem. Mr. Lewis, you, you mentioned um, some of the destruction that was done in the downtown area that we saw a little over a week ago. Did you personally experience any of that, I'm wondering? No, you know, my office is right across the street from Travis Park. And this was the first time that I had to worry about, hey, are my, are my windows broken? Yeah. And uh, nothing was done. And But, you know, there's a lot of other businesses around the area where boards are up and people have to worry about that. And you know, about the property is, is damaged, one thing that I have to keep in mind is that those windows can be replaced, the graffiti can be taken down, but the lives are the things that we cannot replace. So it's really unfortunate that, you know, there is a little bit of, a, of that property being damaged. But again, the bigger picture is, what are we gonna do about that main issue? And yeah. so I try not to focus on the what and try to focus more on the why and further the conversation like you did tonight. I appreciate it, James, for your time. Uh, we're gonna continue the conversation actually tonight around 1030 with more with uh, Mr. James Lewis. Thank you for your time. We'll see you tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks for having me. All right, take care. We'll be right back. You know, one thing not really affected by the coronavirus, 
selfies. Still easy to take while social distancing, but group selfies, that gets a little tricky. It could be easier, though, if Apple builds the software it got the patent for. Yeah, it would allow you to invite people to be in a group selfie. Then it would remove each person's actual background, giving everyone the same background and putting them together in the same image. Apple actually filed for the patent two years ago, but it didn't go through until early this month. As to whether or not the company will actually create and market the software, we will see. I think that's a great idea. You know, um, a lot of things that kids didn't get to do was take their class photos. That's a great that idea. That would have been some great software tips. See, I was thinking yeah. like, you know, stuff in front of the Eiffel Tower. That too. You, know, that. <laughs> you have a more practical, more practical solution there. Adam, it's a hot one. It is, and tomorrow's going to be a little bit hotter than what we had out there today. So tomorrow, we're a little more likely to become our first triple digit day. Hot and humid, and then we will get an extended break from the humidity, unusual for this time of year, but it's going to be uh, very pleasant out there in terms of a lack of humidity by Wednesday. And that's going to lead to some nicer mornings that'll be running below average for a change. We'll talk about everything and even our storm chance for tomorrow coming up. In the buzz today, a million dollar mystery in Colorado has been solved, or at least found. A treasure chest estimated to be worth more than a million dollars hidden in the Rocky Mountains for a decade has finally been found. It was hidden there by art and antiques collector Forrest Fenn. He used it to create a treasure hunt to inspire people to explore nature and give hope to those affected by the Great Recession. Yeah, Fenn left clues to the treasure's location in a poem published in his 2010 autobiography, he announced Sunday the treasure had been found. Fenn estimates up to 350,000 people from all over the world hunted for the treasure. He says some of them quit their jobs. A few even died. The guy who found it wants to stay anonymous. I remember this from years ago. Like yes. Everybody was looking for it. Where did they put it? Yeah. Well, instead of going green for the environment today, maybe you want to go blue for World Oceans Day, the day designated by the United Nations to focus on taking better care of the oceans of the world. This year's theme is innovation for a sustainable ocean. Every year, there are initiatives unveiled around the world to help with that goal. This year, Due to the coronavirus, most events were and are being held online. Organizers say the goal is to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030. All right, turning now to weather, HOT. That's <laughs> all I gotta say, it's so hot outside. It really is. Yeah, we're feeling it. We're going to feel it even more tomorrow, especially when you factor in the humidity. And that's that's the that's the main thing here. Not just hot, but very sticky outside as well. So let's take a look at the current readings out there. 97 at the airport in town. And that's our high temperature for the day, by the way. But that humidity makes it feel like we're at 102. Though tomorrow with a few extra degrees on the thermometer, I think we could feel like it's closer to 105 to 109 for a few hours. Right now, heat indices generally above 100. There are a few exceptions out there, but for the most part, we have the heat index values above 100 and we're feeling that stickiness. 106 is what it feels like in Del Rio. Actual air temperature 104, but Del Rio did have a high temperature of 107 and that was a record for the day. Right now we're 98 Pleasant and 95 Gonzales and 97 currently in Hondo. So yeah, by and large, just hot outside. Now tomorrow morning, we're going to start the day in the 70s, most of us in the upper 70s. We're thinking about 78 here in San Antonio around sunrise tomorrow morning. Then the temperature quickly rises and by the afternoon around 4 or 5 p.m. We should be right around the century mark here in town. And if we do hit 100, that would be the first 100 degree reading so far this year. We're thinking about 102 Hondo and Uvalde to 105 Carrizo Springs. But the key here, too, is the humidity. And that's why we actually have a heat advisory issued by the National Weather Service for locations along and especially east of I-35. So all these orange counties here, meaning the heat index that feels like temperature could make it to 105 to 112 during the afternoon hours from about noon to 7 p.m. And I think that's mostly for folks along the coastal plain, but even here in San Antonio, we are included because we may just hit 105 to 109 for a brief period tomorrow afternoon in terms of the heat index. Air temperature right around 100, but it's this mugginess. I mean, look at these dew points, 60s and 70s, but there's going to be some relief. A not as humid front is what I like to call this one. We'll be moving through town 
And look what that does to our dew points. An extended break in the humidity and lack of humidity. Not common this time of year, but we're going to see a wind shift and it's going to stick around. So it's still going to be warm out there, you know, highs in the low to mid 90s behind that cool front. But look at these dew points, 30s, 40s and 50s. OK, so comfortable conditions in terms of a lack of humidity. And I know some of you love the humidity. You're not going to love Wednesday through the weekend then because it's going to be a little more uh, a little drier in terms of the uh, content of moisture in the air. You can see the big swirl. That's tropical depression moving on out. Just a big, a big rain event is all that is. We're looking at the cold front right here moving through New Mexico, and that's that not as humid front that'll be moving our way, and it's going to make it here tomorrow afternoon and slowly push its way through town. So just some clouds to start the day tomorrow at 7 a.m. Then we get to the noon hour, bright sunshine. Into the afternoon, we're expecting a little line of clouds to develop. And with that line of clouds, maybe a few showers and thunderstorms to sprout up. Isolated in nature, right now we're giving it a 20% chance. But even our future cast is indicating, yeah, as that front hits I-35 and locations east of I-35, can't rule out some storms from developing. And in the off chance we see some storms, there is a slight chance that they could become strong to severe. And then those rain chances really fall off in the rest of the week, 0% just a lot of sunshine and the lack of humidity. So 78 in the morning tomorrow, 88 at noon, then right around 100, but feeling like it's 104 to 109. We factor in the humidity and that 20% chance of a isolated storm tomorrow afternoon. Then we get the break in the humidity Wednesday all the way through the weekend and even into the early part of next week. However, sunny and dry. I mean, we're looking at mornings in the 60s and that's a little below average because of the dry air. But afternoons with that sunshine will still be well into the 90s. So yeah, technically we have a cold front hitting tomorrow, but I don't like to call it that yeah. this time of year. It's going to be a steamy Tuesday. Yes. So yeah, thanks Adam. In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Airlines aren't flying high yet, but it looks like air travelers are starting to take off again. This past weekend saw the busiest air travel since the pandemic began. More than 400,000 people were screened by the Transportation Security, Security Administration on Friday and Sunday, the first time that has happened in nearly 11 weeks. And American Airlines said it saw a boost, too, with its busiest weekend since early March. It's a good sign, but there is still a long way to go. The TSA said Sunday was only 17% of the same Sunday last year. Another indicator that Americans are ready to travel again, at least domestically, Airbnb says it's seeing a surge in bookings as customers emerge following months of being cooped up due to the coronavirus. Airbnb says it got more than U.S. bookings between May 17th and June 3rd than the same time period last year. Customers appear to be sticking to drivable locations within 200 miles of their homes Airbnb officials also says people say people are looking to stay a week or more due to the increase in remote working. Despite the increase, the company is expecting this year's revenue to be half of what it was last year. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. We now know the names of the family of six found dead inside a home on Red Willow on Thursday. The Bear County Medical Examiner identifying them as 38 year old Jared Harless, 36 year old Cheryl Ann Harless, four year old Esteban Lorenzo Harless, three year old Penelope Arcadia Harless, one year old Aviel Magdalena Harless, and four, 11 month old rather Apollo Harless. The family found during a welfare check on Thursday, Chief William McManus says it appears they died of carbon monoxide poisoning. However, the cause and manner has not officially been determined yet. Meantime, friends, family and supporters flocking to a memorial for George Floyd in Houston today after another weekend of mostly peaceful protests across the country. Thousands of people in Houston are expected to pay their respects to 46 year old George Floyd, who was killed while in police custody in Minneapolis on Memorial Day. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez responding to recent calls to reopen three deadly officer involved shooting cases in Bear County. Marquise Jones 
and Troni Scott, Charles Roundtree. Family members of these three men and local activists have recently asked the DA to examine their cases. In a brief statement, the DA says his office does not plan to reopen. Giving back to those who risk their lives, that's the goal behind the San Marcos Police Association fundraising that happened over the weekend. The group raising money for a fallen officer and two others wounded in the line of duty. This weekend, the organization sold barbecue plates, t-shirts, and bracelets to raise cash. The surviving officers were in attendance and say they're grateful for all these support. All right, tomorrow even hotter, right up around 100, but when you factor in the humidity, it could feel as warm as 105 to 109 in the afternoon for a few hours. Then temperatures not quite as high for the rest of the week and into the weekend. Wednesday through Sunday will mostly be in the mid 90s with a lack of humidity, and that's going to mean some more comfortable mornings with temperatures running below average for the morning hours with lows mostly in the mid 60s. So that's going to be pleasant, and if you don't like the humidity, well, you're going to love our weather here Wednesday through the weekend. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for watching the 6 o'clock news. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.